Hello and welcome to this podcast episode of the Hidden Heroes of Tech. This is the show where we shine a light on the brains behind all the successes we see across industries. It takes more than text to get a product in front of a consumer. People from sales, go to market, strategy, marketing, finance, operations, and of course, those techies. We talk with those who we know we don't know much about. We want to try and learn some nuggets of wisdom from these individuals and hope to sort of make ourselves better. Our sponsor for this episode is the revenuedoc.com. This is Mickey, your host for today's episode. So while we wait for our guest to ring the doorbell to enter the studio, let me tell you more about her. Lisa Lee. Lisa is a seasoned professional with a multifaceted career spanning various industries. As the vice president go to market at Awesome Partners, she spearheads comprehensive strategies to accelerate AWS partnership journeys for clients. Lisa's commitment to diversity and inclusion is evident through her founding of Lady Shack, a platform dedicated to empowering women within Caddy Shack community. Her leadership in the Gen AI go to market initiative underscores her innovative approach to cloud technology and strategic alliances. With her extensive experience and expertise, Lisa continues to drive impactful change across the industry. And I'm really, really proud to have in, uh, Lisa join us here today. So hopefully she'll ring the doorbell and enter the studio in the moment. Oh, there she is. Let me bring her in. Hey, welcome, Lisa. How are you? Hey, Mickey. I'm doing great. Thank you. Thanks awesome. for having me. Awesome. It's great to have you on the show. So, hey, Lisa, I just introduced you and I'm really, really pleased to have you on the show. Is there anything I missed off in the introduction there that you'd like to share with us about who you are and where you, where you work and what you do? Um, that sounds good so far. Oh, awesome. OK, so, Lisa, I want to get straight into it. Today's topic of uh, the podcast show is cracking the code into tech sales without a tech background. Now, as the audience knows, you know, this podcast show podcast show is really about, you know, shining on the light shining light on people behind the scenes and some of the things they have had to do or do do behind the scenes to get to where they are. And this is going to be an interesting show because, you know, you don't have a technical background and you've made it into tech and you're in a really, really prominent and visual, visible position in the community of AWS partners. But before we go into that, there is something I want you to share with us because you mentioned to this, this to me the, um, this morning and, and I'm really curious. And you said this, Eight words that made me $35,000 instantly. What the heck are you talking about? And tell me how. Come on, talk to me. Okay. Um, I guess let me give you a little background. I am from um, Korea, and I was raised to when someone offers me a job to say, thank you very much. I will work very hard. I really appreciate the opportunity. And if my mom were here, she would literally bow. It would be at least a 45-degree bow. But oh, wow. what I learned from living and working in San Francisco is to kind of lean forward and say this, am I making as much as the guys? Am I making as much as the guys? Is yeah. that, am I making as much as the guys? Um, Guess what, Mickey? I know you will be shocked to hear that there is still pay disparity, gender disparity in pay in technology, even in the Mecca of San Francisco. Well, that's interesting. That means, obviously, I'm not going to be able to participate in this because I'm a guy. <laughs> so tell me. Um, well, you're probably you already where you're supposed to be. Um <laughs> I, you know, let me, I, I always believe this. I think, um, and this is not a reflection on, you know, being passive or need, not need to stand, stand up for yourself. But I also believe the, the universe helps you get to where you need to get to. And you're going to get what you get, you're owed. And I think all good for you if you stuck up for yourself and you got that extra bit of cash in your salary. And I think the universe was behind you to get it. And that's really, really cool. So well done. Thank Appreciate you. Well, it meant an instant. $15,000 increase in base yeah, and a $20,000 signing bonus. Awesome. I would 
not have received. Now, okay, this is uh, pre-COVID, y'all. So <laughs> <laughs> okay. this is happened 2024, but in the good old days of 2019. Okay. So this, the the point of the point you're making is stick up for yourself, ladies, and do not step back and just accept what's on the table. Make sure you're on equal parity with the with the gentlemen out there. Yeah. Said thank you. All right, awesome. Well, listen, before we get into today's topic, I want to switch gears to you a little bit and want to learn a little bit about who Lisa is. This is the fun bit before we get into the serious meat and bones of the actual conversation. So the first question I got for you. So what did you have for breakfast today? I had four egg whites and two emergencies. What's an emergency? I've never heard of that. An emergency has uh, the kind I take is for uh, to boost your immunity, and it has a thousand milligrams of vitamin C, and it has uh, zinc and vitamin D. And so I put it into water. And uh, Dr. Fauci had recommended it during COVID to boost your immunity. So well, that's a good tip. Yes. You know, do you just buy? Do you just oh, it has electrolytes in it too. Got it. And you just buy these supplements and put them into uh, Yeah, them. they're just little little packets like this. Okay. And it's great when you're on the road. I carry it with me in my laptop backpack. Okay. Um, and this keeps me from getting dehydrated or crashing um, when I'm on the road. Okay. And I take it every day. Interesting. Okay. Next question for you. Um, how are you doing for real today? Because uh, share, share how you're feeling. Um, I... Look, I work for a bootstrap startup and we have two companies and I, you know, like I, uh, I'm exhausted because I've pulled, you know, several all nighters this week, but, but I'm really, really happy because I, I, I love what I'm, I'm doing. I'm very passionate about it. And, and the people I work with, we have deep belly laughs. So like I, I joke that I'm getting paid in belly laughs because like, you know, it's, it's not for the money, not yet. Cause it's a startup, but, um, I, 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 I'm running on fumes right now, but I think you can see in my face that I'm genuinely well, happy. I was about to say, I can't tell that you're running on fumes. You really look well for having spent a full day, you know, doing what you're doing and being exhausted. So well done you. Certainly you. Maybe, maybe that was it, the rescue remedy or what it, is it? that it's right? emergency. It's emergency. Like, <laughs> <that's> <laughs> it. not sponsored by emergency, by the way. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that's cool. Okay. Um, that's good to know you're doing well. Okay. Here's a, another question for you. If you had the choice between two superpowers, being invisible or flying, which would you choose and well, why? This yeah. is easy. I mean, I'm, I'm acrophobic, so I'm afraid of heights. So, uh, but I think I would choose the being invisible, and I would like to use it as a force for good because I think that if you're invisible, you could sneak into a lot of uh, important meetings, and mm. it would just give you um omniscience right where you would like know almost all things and then you know hopefully use that for good and not for evil like to negotiate peace yeah. treaties you know or something like that and not right. you know so corporate you, espionage right when people go to interviews at big companies like mckinsey or baines they have these really great interesting questions and i thought it'd be interesting to ask you a question like that do you mind if i ask you one of these questions go for it Okay, so here we go. I, you've not seen this question, just so the audience knows. No. Okay, good. Here we go. Right. After we finish this interview, you step outside the studio and you find a lottery ticket on the floor to win $10 million. And it's actually the winning ticket. What would you do? Oh, this is very, very easy, right? I mean, I work for a startup. <laughs> <laughs> I immediately fund my company, you know, I, you know, buy a lot of cool software, you know, I hire a team and uh, yeah, we, we hit it. Um, that, that, that's super, super easy. I mean, oh. come on, if you give me a layup, I'm going to take it. <laughs> well, that's very generous to actually put the money into the startup. Well, thank you for sharing that. What is the spiciest opinion that most people disagree with your spiciest opinion that most people disagree with. Okay. Um, this is a regional thing and you might want to cut this, but right now I'm in Austin, Texas. Okay. And uh, I have less rights as a woman um, mm -hmm. than I did in college. Mm -hmm. So in Texas, um, once you're past six weeks, even if you're raped or a victim of incest, you can't get an abortion. Okay. And, um, 
most women don't even know they're pregnant after six weeks, Mickey. I mean, I've had two children and, you know, we're busy and periods are irregular and birth control isn't 100%. No form of birth control other than abstinence is 100%. So I know people, you know, on either coast are like, what? You know, that that's, they can't even comprehend that. But uh, this is a regional thing. And, in and, and, uh, you know, many parts of the United States between New York and San Francisco, this, this is very normal now where a woman doesn't have autonomy over her own body. So, you know, I know this is like not a super fun topic. And if you want to cut it and ask me something else. No, no. So listen, um, the similar thing has come up in another podcast show where my guest I brought exactly the same talk topic um, that, you know, upsets her. And it's not just that it's our right to be who we are in the United States of America, the freedom to be and choose who we are. So she went a bit forward uh, further and said, it's not just about women's rights. It's about our right to have choice. You know, she, you know, and particularly with the, the, um, uh, uh, the constitution the way it is you know people are hunkering in on that so we don't want to talk too much about politics but it's a valid opinion and i'm not going to cut it out so um, you. good for you absolutely okay i'm going to get into the topic today and it's about you not coming from a tech background and getting to tech sales and the first thing i want to start with which was something you mentioned when we were reviewing for this topic i want to start with this topic or this question you said I am more successful than many celebrities because my children are happy. Let's start there before we get into the meat. Tell me about that. Uh, let me take a step back here and say that um, for me, I think that I'm already successful because my children are functional and they speak to me. So, um, uh, you know, unfortunately for, you know, Britney Spears, it seems like she and her children are estranged. It's very unfortunate. Um, and, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, that's their business, certainly. Uh, but for me, like, I feel successful. Um, because, you know, my children seem like they're, they're happy, they have uh, careers, which fulfill them. Uh, one is a military officer, one is a high school football coach. And trust me, they're not doing it for the money. <laughs> they're doing it for love. And so like, I'm really, you know, happy that my boys are in careers that they love and you know we hang out we go to dinner and we have a good time and we text and we talk and we hang out so like for me i feel like i'm successful i mean elon musk may be the richest or the second richest man on earth but apparently his oldest child chooses to not communicate with him which is really yeah. sad to me. well you know well done you and, and that's a great measure of success you know is your own family and children talking to you Great. Um, so one of the things that takes me on to the next part of the conversation is, and it's sort of to do with your children, you know, your career on Wall Street, um, you went through that, you had two children, and you had a taxi crash. Um, and tell me a little bit about that, because that was quite pivotal in what you did next, I guess, in your life. Thank you. So I like to say that I started out with a mom and pop called Morgan Stanley. So it's an S&P 100 company, you know, obviously one of the largest financial companies in the world. And um, I was a stockbroker, uh, one of the only women. Uh, most of the women back then, they were um, sales assistants and operations or admins. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with it, uh, but I was a producer and I've always been a producer. And, uh, you know, they were very condescending to me. They thought I was a sales assistant. They would ask um, me to bring them coffee. Uh, they would, uh, you know, give me helpful advice like, oh, you should wear more makeup and shorter skirts. I'm sure that would bring you more business. Um, you know, I would experience like open racism. People would call me Risa Ree. Um, and then, you know, I, I had two children, 23 months apart. Um, and it actually wasn't a taxi crash. I actually got run over by a taxi cab in New York City, Mickey, when I was already the mother of one and I was 14 weeks pregnant with my second child. So oh my God. I spent the whole pregnancy on bed rest and uh, I gained 50 pounds and I was actually a deemed 9% permanently uh, disabled uh, from oh. being uh, run over by the taxi cab. So for two years, I couldn't run 
or um, take any impact, you know, it was just like extremely, extremely, you know, in pain and having a really hard time. Oh, wow. Had a newborn that I was nursing and I had, you know, a toddler. They're, they're, you know, less than two years apart. So it was a really painful, physically painful and exhausting time uh, in my life. And I, I went right back to work because uh, you can't go for more than two years without your license expiring. I had a, uh, you know, FINRA Series 7 uh, and a Series 66. So I had to go back to work. But of course, my firm accidentally let my license expire. So while I was working full time and having to put the kids in Montessori and commuting three hours a day, I had to study at night. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so the first time I got a 90 uh, on the, the seven and the second time I got an 89. So I dropped a point because, you know, I was nervous. So so how did you how did you manage that? Because I'm sure you're not I mean, you're not exactly the same, but I'm sure there's quite a few um, people out there who've had similar types of situations where, you know, you've got this high pressure career, you've got children, maybe not have a taxi crash or get run over by a taxi, but something other disaster in their, in their, in their life takes place. How did you get around that and pick yourself up and move forward? Talk, talk us about that. Talk to us about that. You know, I, I think that, um, I, I, I mean, what choice did I have, right, back then? Uh, I think that, um, I, I mean, I do come from like a 5,000-year-old culture, um, a very resilient uh, people. And just in my immediate family, my grandparents and my parents were occupied uh, by the Japanese. My grandfathers were, uh, you know, both died in the war and my both parents grew up half orphan. So, I know people talk about now about generational trauma, but I think that there's also generational resilience, right? I mean, we we survived all that. So as hard as my life, you know, might have felt to me, it's certainly nothing compared to what my parents endured, mm -hmm. you know, being occupied by the Japanese. It was a harsh, harsh occupation. Most Americans don't understand the brutality that Koreans suffered under the Japanese occupation. And then they were invaded by the Chinese, you know, and yeah. the North Koreans again. So, like my poor parents, uh, you know, just, they they really suffered. How did you take all that from your parents and your ancestors and your experiences, and how did you process that? Because for the audience, a little bit of what steps did you take that they could think about if they find themselves in similar environments? I think that. You have to find a peace and a way to comfort yourself. Um, whatever works for you, uh, whether it is meditation, whether it is being in nature, whether it is finding refuge in music or art or, um, you know, exercise, um, you know what? Um, I did be before I got <laughs> before I got run over by the taxi. You know, I, I I did make time to exercise because I remember I had a boss at Morgan Stanley who told me that brokers who work out um, are like you know five times you know more successful than brokers who don't. I mean, brokers who didn't probably died of a heart attack. Um, so um, yeah, I think you have to find whatever gives you comfort, and you have to carve out space um for that uh for that comfort um you know honestly when i look back i i think i i think much like childbirth i i blocked out a lot of the pain so you know i'm sorry i don't think i have a lot of things that i can rinse and repeat you know for 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 that time in my life i probably have more things that i can rinse and repeat for for tech because that was more more recent but you know like i said it, it's like giving birth if women remembered how much it hurt the first time we probably wouldn't have more than one child but you know i had to <laughs> so i blocked it out uh, okay well fair enough uh, that, that, that's that's thank you for that because i think finding solace in that um you know that alternative um meditating or listening to music or art you know it's definitely a good coping strategy i guess yeah i i would say from, from my ancestors i mean we have um we do have like <laughs> the, you know what for my heritage it's the food 
it's the comfort in in Korean food. So I know that everybody knows Korean barbecue, but um, there's like a lot of kind of um, like Korean soups that I like. <laughs> like there's a Cornish ham that's stuffed with sticky rice, and it's it's stewed with ginseng and and herbs. It's almost like a medicine. So it's, oh, it's like comfort food. Yes, exactly. Like it. So it's another coping strategy. Yes. Okay, well, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, so you came from Korea. Tell us a little bit about your journey from Korea to the USA, because you've not been in the USA all along. You know, you've 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 had these children. You've been to Morgan Stanley. You've had the car crash or the taxi crash where somebody's run you over. But, you know, how did you get here? Tell us a little bit about that journey. Um, yeah. So um, my father was transferred to New York City when I was three years old. And um, he worked for the largest shipping company in Korea, and they put him on a boat first, uh, you know, container ship to learn the business. And he was a business guy. He wasn't the mariner. And in Hawaii, there was a fountain with free pineapple juice, and he drank so much he got sick. And he said, this is the best country in the whole world because pineapple juice was really expensive. And he said, America is so rich. I'm going to bring my family here. And uh, my poor mom had never been on a plane and was on a plane with three kids under the age of five. And so we moved to New York when I was three and um, we uh, opened a shoe store when uh, when I was 10 because we were supporting relatives in Korea. And that's how I learned how to sell when I was 10 years old. Ah, um, so your sales acumen came from yes. the shoe shop. Yes, uh, that's where I learned to measure my work success by how much I sold every day and we better sell double on Saturday. So thanks mom and dad. Although they're, they're bitterly disappointed that I didn't go to Harvard and become a doctor. So. Oh, awesome. Well, okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense. So that journey from Korea, your father coming here, starting at the shoe shop introduces you to the concepts of sales really early in your life. Correct. Exactly. Uh, now I'm yeah. starting to see the link back to how you've ended up here. That's really That's interesting. Exactly, because I learned how to make deals when I was 10 years old. You were dealing with shoes. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, yeah, because you, you want people to, you know, to you learn that when the customer is there, they're ready to buy. So you start incenting them. Well, hey, if you buy like two or th three pairs, let me give you you know, a deal or like, hey, this is in the back and we haven't even pulled it out yet. And this would look amazing on you. Let me bring it out. So that's that's where I learned how to sell. And then amazingly, I became like the top salesperson for Girl Scout cookies and yearbooks. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. So another thing that you talked about was as a mom, and I think, you know, that's after the whole. And actually, I don't know. Let me ask you this. What does this mean to you? Mom's coming back to work. Well, you know what? It's really hard to, it's, it's hard to leave your baby, but babies are very expensive and college is very expensive. And aside from that, you know, women get a lot of, you know, we're, we're professionals and we deserve to be able to work if, you know, go back to our careers if we, if we want to. Um, and so, yeah, one of the reasons that I joined my company, Awesome Partners, is because we have a program called the Mother's Bridge, where for moms who've been out of work, we'll help them get certifications with Amazon Web Services so they can find jobs within the AWS. That's um, really cool. So let me go back to you. So when you were a mom coming back to work, what, what were the challenges you were facing, which now this new program with Awesome Partners is helping out with? Oh, well. <laughs> there's two things. There's moms coming back to work, right? When I was married, it was fine. I went back to, you know, to a giant uh, company. But uh, when I was divorced and taking care of two kids and I couldn't travel all the time because I didn't have the support and I, you know, couldn't work around the clock, I had to take, you know, kind of a kind of a mom job, right? Like I had to leave sales and I had to go into you know, more of a business role with the law firm um, and, you know, take a giant pay cut. So when my children were in college and I was an empty nester, you know, I decided that I didn't want to do the same thing. I had proven myself on Wall Street, but I was tired of wearing a suit. And, you know, I'd already done that for 15 years. I wanted a new challenge. And so what happened to me is I visited 
San Jose in 2017. And, um, you know, my friend Elvis Titus, who was with um, Apple at the time, very kindly took me to the Apple mothership. You know, and it was it was incredible, right? Like going to Apple HQ, and I was like, you know, he but he couldn't take us to his office because they're they're super tight on security. But you know, we went and visited, and then he took us to the Tesla, you know, plant, and I saw robots lifting cars off the assembly line, you know, and guys are riding, you know, razor scooters, and you know, I was like, my eyes were opened, and I was like, this is way better than wearing a suit on Wall Street. Like, I want to be a part. Like, I want to be with these cool kids. Like, even though I, I was, you know a middle-aged mom, like, I didn't want to wear a suit on Wall Street after, you know, after seeing this, like, I yeah. wanted to to go, you know, be yeah. with the cool kids in San Francisco. So did that, how did that, did that present you any challenges getting into the tech world? What, 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 tell us a bit about that. Um, yes, actually, uh, <laughs> um, even though I had been uh, a vice president at um, an S&P 100, you know, firm, and you know had been doing that for 15 years literally nobody in san francisco cared <laughs> like they could they could care less i mean to them it's a negative they're like oh that's very old economy we you they didn't care yeah you know, they're like you didn't go to stanford you didn't go to berkeley you don't know anything about tech they literally did not give a flying flip okay. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> good choice of word <laughs> yes yes exactly um, it was uh, it was disheartening, um, you know. So what, so what did you do? I mean, how did you break through? This is the crux of today's podcast. How did you break through that barrier? Okay, so um, I I hustled, you know. So this is something you know that it's the same skill set that I used when I was breaking into Wall Street as a woman and minority. I'll, although. When I broke into Morgan Stanley, I had gotten the highest score on a math test. I couldn't exactly do that for tech because everybody had the highest score on the math test for tech. Um, but I did, you know, well over 100 meetings in person in San Francisco. And um, I used LinkedIn. You know, I would cold message people. OK, never ask to pick someone's brain. That's annoying. But I would just ask them like, you know, hey, you know, I would just love to, you know, have coffee and get advice from you like you know most people um everyone's really busy but if you just ask them for a 15 minute coffee and you tell them well this is you know i'm gonna come to your you know your office you pick the time you pick the place and you know i i drove all over the bay and uh, i drove all the way to livermore for for lunch which is in the east bay and i was living in san francisco and i met with a sales vp named rick probst and, um, you know, Rick was like, oh, you know, I, I don't have anything right now, but, um, you know, let's keep in touch. And I kept in touch with him. And then a couple of months later, um, he got back to me. And, uh, of course, I had to take, like, you know, a massive pay cut. And I started at the very bottom. I was a, you know, sales development representative and he gave me a headset and I'm like, I can do it. And he's like, are you sure? I'm like, yes. And I had to drive, you know, like an hour and a half each way. And I had to work like, you know, 730, you know, and be there at 730 AM. But um, I know you'll be shocked, Mickey, to hear like after three weeks, I got promoted and then I covered the largest companies in the world, like in NVIDIA. Okay. <laughs> Well, what, were you, what were you what were you selling at that I was time? selling security software and I'm very proud to say that I closed uh, Splunk and I closed Tanium these are you know companies that uh, make software and they don't buy outside okay. software and uh, I asked Rick recently I said you know what made you take a chance on me because you know I, I'm an outsider and he said that uh, Rick looked for outgoing personalities a drive the willingness to learn and be coached and someone who can offer specifics of why they should be hired. And he said, um, in my case that I showed that I was an excellent networker and I had contacts that were going to be valuable to the company. Yeah. So it sounds like one of the key things is that you were willing to be coached because not many people are. And that's one of the key attributes that he's probably seen in you to get you through. So definitely the hustle, persistence, networking, and are willing to listen and learn. And I think 
given that you were in this industry, that's got you through. So really well done on that. That's that's really cool. So tell us a little bit about um, AWS. Where did your a- journey with AWS start? Yes, in November of 2022, um, I joined a um, an advanced partner of AWS, and originally I was hired as the sales leader. Wow. So you've never sold AWS and you've now walked into an AWS advanced partner and now you're doing what exactly? How are you feeling at this stage? Uh, well, the it, well, here's the funny thing. So I had actually met the CEO of the company um, in 2018 and she had offered me a lesser role and I had turned it down. And I had met her when I won the class prize uh, the, the class pitch contest at Stanford Continuing Studies, um, the selling and marketing SaaS uh, to the enterprise uh, class, um, the, the instructor had recommended me to a VC for leadership development. And it's that VC who introduced me to the CEO of the company. So the right. CEO had seen my career progress and had lowballed me, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> in 2018 and had seen my career progress over four years. So it sounds like a woman lowballed a woman there. <laughs> so how did you how did you bridge, how did you bridge the gap? I'm not going to name any names here, but I think that person had seen my career progression. And so by the time we met up again, you know, she was ready for me to, uh, you know, to, to lead sales for the company. Uh, but what I quickly realized is for an organization as complex uh, at as uh, AWS, that you really couldn't just go in there and just try to do to to do deals. You really needed to have a uh, total alignment with AWS um, in terms of AWS's values in order to do business with AWS. Okay, so how did you? quickly get to learn about AWS because where you are with awesome partners today is an amazing position and clearly the AWS community knows you really well and they admire you in such a short space of time what did you do to quickly get into being able to sell with AWS um thank you uh (laughs) you know I I think I've gone both um top down and bottom up right there's um 15,000 partners or more in North America. Um, but how many of them do you think have Rich Giraffo's cell phone number, Mickey? Oh, I wouldn't know. Even I don't have Rich Giraffo's cell number, and I'm in AWS. <laughs> so, you do? Hey, you know, maybe you can send that over <laughs> to me. <laughs> uh, you know, so, but the thing is, look, one seller at AWS can change the future of an AWS partner. Um, So, you know, you really, um, the approach that I've taken in working with AWS, like I said, it's top down and bottoms up. But I think that the reason why I have um, had success with AWS in a relatively short time is that I have such good intentions that are backed by actions. You know, Um, I think that, uh, look, every, you know, Every partner has like an incredible product or incredible service or, you know, great consulting skills, but there's 15,000 of them, you know, so eventually uh, it becomes a commodity and there's like 150,000 partners um, uh, worldwide. But what I um, am known for, or I think, or I've been told is that I'm able to create strategies that are truly win, win, win. A win for AWS, a win for the AWS customer, and a win for (laughs) (laughs) okay, come on, (laughs) come on now. (laughs) And a win for for the partner because I I truly go in there um, uh, with empathy for for all the parties. And I think that that is a result of having, you know, grown up in, in, you know, multiple cultures and multiple languages and multiple countries. And, you know, I didn't become a U.S. citizen until I was a senior in high school, Mickey. I mean, I I think people think I'm American, but, 
you know, I really didn't become a U.S. citizen until, you know, I was an adult. Okay. Well, that sounds pretty amazing. You've done a really good job with AWS and you've got a great reputation. Let me just switch gears a little bit to something else which you're passionate about, women in partners. Tell, tell me a little bit about your work around <laughs> promoting women in partners. What's going on there? Okay, so um, so Caddyshack is really an incredible organization. It is the largest global partner alliance community for um, for AWS uh, partners, and it's for the professional cloud alliance directors. Um, it's not for sales. Uh, we currently represent more than 500 AWS partners across 16 countries. And uh, just the the public companies in our network, um, their revenue is like more than 250 billion, and we hope to be at um, 1,000 um, members by the end of um, you know say 12 months from today, and it, it's March of 2024. So y'all can hold me accountable. So and what's this Lady Shack platform? That you've been <laughs> yeah, so I know you'll be shocked, Mickey, to hear that the leadership of Caddy Shack was 12 men. And, you know, they joke that, hey, you know, it's like the, you know, the Jesus of the disciples. I'm like, hey, guys, like even Jesus had Mary Magdalene and Jesus's mom. I think we need to have some, you know, chick energy in this group. So the first thing I did when I joined the parent company of Caddyshack, which is Awesome Partners, is I started Lady Shack <laughs> it's for the women of Caddyshack. And so I've created... Um, a community for women and we just had our first uh, zoom coffee on the first day of women's history month on march 1st of 2024 and congratulations uh, congratulations thank you thank you and we will be partnering with uh, women at aws and uh, you know we're already planning a, a woman in gen ai fireside chat in new york city and you know look we're not anti-man you know i'm the mother of two two you know fine young men but um you know it's just really nice having you know a community of women who are all in the same job and uh you know it's just nice to be around you know women's energy for a change you know awesome i hope you're gonna keep us men not don't keep us men out all the time. Uh, no, we are we are we are strong. Uh, you know, we are we are strong fans. And actually, I need to thank you, Mickey, because um, in talking to you and thinking about my journey, really, like uh, so many uh, allies, male allies, have opened you know doors for me. Like you know, Greg Kidd was the first person who told me, you belong in San Francisco, come to San Francisco. And he was Jack Dorsey's mentor. You know, Greg is the first person who gave Jack a tech job. And Greg was, you know, first round in score on Twitter. And when someone like that tells you <laughs> that you belong in San Francisco, now, did he help me find a job? No, but did he believe in me? Yes, right? So it was you, Mickey, who told me that, you know, don't, exclude the allies. So I'm happy to share that at the Caddyshack Femina Tech Awards at AWS reInvent in 2024, as we partner with women at AWS, we're going to start a new category for allies. We're going to call it the Awesome Ally Hall of Fame. And we're going to have a new category for AWS you know, allies and AWS partner allies. And we're going to nominate the allies and so I, I need to work out the details, but I'm thinking that people can vote on their, you know, their favorite allies and have the votes be donations that go to Girls Who Code. Yeah. So there's one thing I'd, I'd really want to sort of dive, dive deep into about supporting women in industry. I think outside of diversity and inclusion and equity, you know, equality, there is something, you know, women do put a lot of effort in to get the same level of knowledge and position. However, there's also the concept of diverse experiences. Okay. And if we could eliminate, you know, the, the sexism part of who actually brings that experience to the table and eliminate it's a male or a female, there's a lot of wisdom we can share with each other. And I, sometimes I'm going to say this and I might be a bit controversial. I know I've been part of some women's sales groups and I've offered uh, my articles, which are not biased in any way, it's just about pure selling or pure go-to-market strategies. But I've been 
kept out of the group because I was not a woman. And I think, you know, anybody who's starting a woman's group out there should consider what other wisdom do you need to share with your women to empower women more? It doesn't necessarily have to come from a woman. I mean, it also, uh, you know, it could come from a man. It could come from a child. It could come from a different race. And I think this is my personal view. Maybe there's too many limitations of who can participate in empowering women, you know, and it, I like the idea of what you're doing with the allies thing, because I think there are a lot of men out there who support women. I just think we get tainted a little bit by the, the overall <laughs> negativity of it all. Um, I appreciate what you're saying. And I think that, um, you know, everyone in San Francisco will say that since me too, it's been a little, you know, weird. Right. And also, as gender lines are being blurred too, right? Like we can't even say, you know, men and women yeah. um, anymore. So, so that's a thing. And um, look, I realize that people do want uh, safe spaces yeah. and, you know, for you and I, right? Like as Asians, I mean that, you know, that's something we've had to, you know, watch out for too. Um, I think that uh, one of my values in every single thing that I do uh, whether it's personal or work or, uh, you know, with, um, uh, you know, with, with all these volunteer things is, you know, I, I want people to feel respected and, and, and valued. And, you know, you can't like, you know, disregard someone just because of, you know, how they represent yeah. or, you know, where they come from or something like that. But I do understand that people are craving uh, safe spaces. So yeah. if there is a way that we could figure out where people feel both safe um, and and valued. Um, that would be ideal. Cool. Sorry about that. Bit of editing for me to do this week. <laughs> okay. Um, I let me get back to where I was. I'm so fed up of this platform today. No worries. I'm gonna put on some lip gloss while you're doing that, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, do your lip gloss, and then I will. Okay. Thank you for that, Lisa. Um, thank you for that, Lisa. Let me just switch gears a bit. It's been a really enlightening discussion about your journey and coming from career and the challenges you face. I just want to go back to you for a little bit. Um, what, what's one idea that experts in your field say that you disagree with? I think that if I'm going to be specific about my business, I would say that among the AWS partner world, that it's not about your product, okay, or your mm -hmm. service. Now, everybody wants to, all the partners think, oh my gosh, if I could just tell AWS, like how great my, you know, insert name of product or service is, you know, then they'll just, you know, they'll, they'll just bring all these customers to me and you know they think all they need to do is tell you about their product and differentiate from their competitors and then you know frankly you know folks at aws they don't need another lunch and learn they yeah. could eat a free lunch every day for the next you know ten thousand years they don't need another breakfast uh lunch or dinner or happy hour like they they want to work and go home okay? yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like they you know everybody's trying to get fit they don't need more food Okay. Um, so my thing would be that if you really want to partner with AWS, you have to live as AWS. It's not about your product or your service. So that's interesting. You know, just like you know, just like AWS tells AWS, you know, leaders start with the customer and work backwards. If you're an AWS partner, guess what? Guess who your customer is? It's mm -hmm. AWS. Yeah. So to the partner, you need to work vigorously to earn and keep you know, your customer's trust. That's interesting. A good perspective. I really enjoyed listening to you on that one. Okay. Um, in the, in your field, who are the favorite people you follow? You know, who are the people that think, you know, are worth the audience could, you know, look to and say, Hey, we can get some wisdom. You know, I think you've got a few names in there. So I, I'm going to offer someone who is an AI pioneer that probably a lot of folks 
uh, don't know, but he was uh, really, he got his um, PhD in AI 20 years ago, and he was an API pioneer. His name is Stephen Wilmot, S-T-E-V-E-N, W-I-L-L-M-O-T-T, and he was the CEO of 3Scale, and he already had a successful exit. He sold the company to Red Hat, um, and he is now with a company called Safe Intelligence, and, you know, he doesn't have this big, you know, LinkedIn right. uh, brand, uh, but he's a, you know, successful founder, and um, he's a thought leader among, um, you know, AI scientists. And uh, he's a VC, uh, an investor and advisor. And um, I really, you know, respect him. He doesn't have this, you know, giant uh, brand, but he's someone that that I follow. Right. That's great. Thank you. Um, we'll look sure to look him up as well. But what's your favorite part of your job? You know what? I love that I'm able to help so many partners. Um, I feel like um, I can lift up my profession, we have started the first um, certification actually for professional cloud alliance directors in the AWS community. It's called MasterCAD. Right. And, uh, you know, we're doing this globally. I was in the inaugural cohort and at HQ1 in Seattle. We're doing this in, uh, in Austin, uh, New York City, London, um, San Francisco. So it's really exciting. I feel like we elevate uh, our profession and, uh, you know, I love being able to, you know, help partners. You know, what we do is uh, we really align partners with AWS and then we accelerate their partner journey and then we amplify their voice within AWS to help them get heard, you know, through the sea of, you know, 150,000 partners, uh, you know, in the, the global partner org. So, uh, you know, I guess I, I'm one of those Mr. Rogers helpers, you know, Mr. Rogers said, look for the helpers. Yeah. And uh, I've always been a helper. Oh, awesome. Um, thank you for that. Um, okay. Um, quick rapid fire for you. Um, what's your favorite book? Gosh. Um, Herodotus, the histories. It Because guess what? Everything repeats itself. Awesome. And look, I want your book list afterwards as well. You're the best books. And then we can put it in the comments below. So what's your favorite movie or show? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, I, you know what? Until the very last episode, I really did enjoy Game of Thrones. Although, right. yeah, although the book, although the book is a million times better because the show only has like 92% of what the the book has got although it, it. waiting for the last book i'm really worried george r, r. martin because we're getting kind of old you promised us the last book it's not awesome. here yet. what's your favorite meal um surf and turf with um blue crab and a black and blue steak okay what's your favorite song or album of all time um, I like Damien Rice, the O album. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, we come to the end of the podcast show, but where can people go to learn more about you, Lisa? Um, you can go to LinkedIn and my name is Lisa Lee. And I know there's 80 Lisa Lees in San Francisco. Um, I'm with Awesome Partners and it's awesome spelled like AWS yeah. and then it's O-M-E. And we can put the links down in the comments okay. so they can find Thank you. you. Um, what can people expect from you next? What's happening next that we don't know yet about you? Well, obviously, I would like to grow our companies to grow um, to grow Caddyshack to you know to more than a thousand partners and to grow you know awesome partners to to really you know being uh, you know a, a global uh, company and then I do have a creative project that I'm hoping will be my, uh, you know, creative uh, legacy that is sort of based on my academic uh, field of study, which would is related to uh, to Asia, and it would be uh, kind of historical. Well, we, can, we, can, we can watch out for that, I guess, <laughs> coming up from you. Okay. Um, is there anything we haven't covered in today's show that you'd like to say before we close out? 
Um, yes, actually, for people who are trying to break into tech, um, there's a woman I worked with at Braze named Zoya Segelbacher, and I'll share a link with you. And she uh, just uh, two weeks ago has founded a company called Uncapped. And this company addresses the need for quality, uh, you know, networking. And it's a sales platform designed to bring more diversity into tech sales. And so it's B2B sales education to individuals and company sales teams. So I believe that you can get enablement to try to get a job um, in tech. And then I know that there are um, SDR academies for people who are trying to break in. Um, so I mentioned Rick Probst, who's the gentleman who gave me the opportunity to break into tech. Well, you know, the cobbler's children have no shoes. His daughter-in-law, uh, you know, he wanted her to get into tech and she wouldn't listen to him, but I had visited him to, to thank him, uh, you know, uh, last summer. And he's like, can you speak to Mariah? Cause she <laughs> won't listen to me. And I sat down with her and, you know, she's a lovely, intelligent young woman. Her name is Mariah Brown. And, um, and I was like, you know, what are you doing? And she was working hourly and, you know, she was, you know, fine and making money. But I said, um, you know, I coached her a little and then guess what? She's, kicking ass as a senior SDR for Big ID. Awesome. And she's been promoted. And um, she had actually gone to one of those sales academies and they trained her and they got her interviews and they coached her. And I talked to her recently and I said, Mariah, like, what was it that I said that stuck with you that made you, you know, take the next step when your own father-in-law <laughs> <laughs> been able to, you know, to to help you take this leap. And she said, Lisa, when you told me that I could make more money if I worked harder and I worked smarter, like awesome. that was what uh, she found intriguing. So like, uh, yeah, so I, I hope if, if anything that for people who are trying to break into tech, uh, look, I was a liberal arts major. I passed the foreign and serve yep. exam. I made it on Wall Street without a business background. I made it in tech without a tech background. Yeah. Uh, Mariah was working as a massage therapist. Like, we did it. You can do it, too. Yeah. And ideally, you move to San Francisco or New York for, you know, a year and a half at least. But I know that most people can't do that. But, you know, Mariah's in Michigan. She mm. did this 100% remote. Um, if you can, I recommend that you move in person because the network that I made in San Francisco, three years in San Francisco, I, I've not had to apply for another job since then because I got to know people. You've done um, really, really, you've done really, really well. It's amazing. Um, what was the favorite part of this podcast to close off? You know what, Mickey? I love your impromptu questions, right? Because for me, um, I have to speak in public a lot and, uh, you know, type A stands for Asian and I prepare and I do my homework and it's not often that I get to be spontaneous, uh, but it's fun to be spontaneous with you. That was fun. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that's great. Well, listen, thank you to our guest today, um, Lisa. Um, it's been a true pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed the show today. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the reminders uh, to the Hidden Heroes of Tech podcast on YouTube. Uh, where do you see this whole full video but also you can get this episode on audio using any of the major podcast platforms uh, apple spotify etc i look forward to you all joining me on the next episode uh, i want to say thank you once again to lisa and um i will see you next time everybody <laughs> <laughs>